Okay, today is April the 16th, 2013, and would you introduce yourself, your name, uh, your family name, and where and when you were born? Okay. Um, my name is Marion Sachs. Um, I was born Marion Ruth Rodlin, and I was born on 116 North Pearl Street. Got born at home in those days. I had friends in, in grade school. Uh, there were five of us that were born. One was born the second, who was Irene Workman. Her dad was a barber in downtown Kent for many years. She was in my class. And Phyllis Myers lived in Cahaga Street. She was born on the fifth. I was born on the seventh on North Pearl Street. Mary Marsh lived in Forest Drive. Her dad was a mechanic down at Giffords. No, no mothers worked then, so. But her father was a mechanic. Um, Ken Vian, whose parents, well, they lived all over town when we were growing up. But they, they lived, I grew up with him, and he was born on the 10th. So we had a lot of people that I grew up with and played with and went to school with. Before at the same time, I did. And my dad uh, worked for Standard Oil Company. He, um, he drove an oil wagon. He first came to Ken and drove a, a horse and team and delivered uh, gasoline to where we delivered it in those days. I don't think there were many cars in 1917, but maybe there were farm equipment or something, I don't know. But he did deliver it by wagon, and, and, and then he also managed the bulk plant at on West Main Street across from where, uh, the building is still there, across from where the old twin coach was. And that was um, Standard Oil bulk station. There were big tanks out by the railroad there. They're gone now, of course, but they were big oil tanks around that property where they mm. stored oil. Mm. Pam? Um, so your dad started off with his horse and wagon? Yes, he did. And then he drove, when, when I was a little girl by that time, he was there his truck. Okay. And uh, he continued to work for Standard? He worked for Standard Oil all his life and retired from there. Um, he weren't very wealthy people, but Daddy always had a job during the Depression, so we never really, mm -hmm. you know, we had and, uh, What was like? For your mother, what did you? What was your mother's day like? Well, all mothers in those days, I think, were pretty hard. We wouldn't consider that. There were no automatic washers, so I can. I, I often talk about wash day because it was so similar. When I talked to my husband, his mother, even all my friends, you hung your clothes outside. Number one, I did that when I was first married. I didn't have a dryer for. Didn't have an automatic. Well, I had an automatic washer. Right after the first one came, we had a conventional washer, we got on workshops. But we didn't have a dryer for a number of years, so everybody hung their clothes out. So a wash day, you know, it involved conventional washers, uh, starching all the clothes, um, starching daddy's work clothes. Um, that was hard. And I remember we always had bean soup, which I didn't like. My father lied. <laughs> But that was something you could throw on. I mean, you soaked the beans Sunday night and threw them on. And Daddy would come home for, for lunch. So when I came home from school, I walked from Central School. I went to Central School and walked home for lunch. And that would be bean soup on Monday, which I didn't care for. But that's what we had. And was wash day always Monday? Always Monday, I think, for was everybody. It Wasn't it everyone's home? And uh, then Tuesday, I, I don't remember how good she was about ironing on Tuesday. Sterling's mother was really the one. My husband's mother had a, had a routine that it never deviated. Monday was wash day, Tuesday was ironing, Wednesday was mending, Thursday was something else, Friday was cleaning, and Saturday was baking oh. and getting ready for Sunday, too. Meal. She, she never deviated. But my mother wasn't that. But she worked, you know, they, they worked hard. I mean, she didn't have cleaners. Where did she go shopping? Where was the groceries? What she didn't drive. 
So we walked to town. Well, we traded at Ferreras for a. We traded at first for Sacones. Sacones is on the corner. Was on the corner of Franklin and Summit Street there, and um, now I believe it's some kind of a man fixes furniture in there or, or mm -hmm. does a bottom of canes chairs. Mm -hmm. There's a and sign that, out there, you know where that was? And that's, that's where Sacones was. And Mr. and Mrs. Sacone lived upstairs. I remember going there with my folks in the car to get groceries. Well, my mother was very anti-liquor, anti-beer. She was really... Um, Temperance. Uh, yeah, very much so. And, as a lot of people were in those days. And she didn't smoke either. And uh, so we went there until Prohibition ended, which I was probably about four. Wasn't that 33 or 32? 33, 33, I think. Anyway, when that ended, Mr. Sacone put in the beer garden in and that ended that. So then we went to Ferreras. And Ferreras had just built the building, which is on the corner of Summit Street and DePeister. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can remember. Oh, I right. went to the opening of that. I can remember that. I can't be very old, but I thought it was wonderful. They had balloons and baby balloons. So yeah, that's. And right. what was in the grocery store when you were? Well, like everything was on the shelves in the meat department. They waited on you. They, they, even when I was married, when I first was married in '48, you still went to the Acme store in downtown Kent, and you went to a counter where the man with butcher was behind the counter, and you told him what you wanted. And that scared me to death because I, I didn't know what I wanted at all. <laughs> but I remember that's what you had to do, and that's where the stores were. You told the man. That's why the long course was on downtown Kent too. And I went there with my girlfriend all the time because they traded there, so she would get set down there. They were from a very big family, and she would go for her mother, and we would walk down and go into long course and. And uh, Mr. Longhorn, Jean Jake's dad worked in there, and he used to wait on my girlfriend. And uh, they would get it off the shelves or whatever you needed, you know, or, or you could order groceries. Now, Mrs. Spellman, Comfort's mother, she ordered from the Eiffel's. And she called up and gave them her order, and then the Eiffel star came up the street and brought her groceries. Mmm. Now, where was Eiffel's? I post was in the block. I'm trying to think now. It's is that on water? Yeah, it was South. in the second block. It was in the old Getz block, and that burned down. And now I don't know. I, I haven't been down there. Like, well, yeah, is that where the where the uh, home savings area? Yeah, that's where it is. Where the bank is. Where I go. So they would deliver the groceries. Yeah, they could comfort. deliver groceries, and I think I think one place did also if you wanted that. And they even delivered groceries when I, in back, when did I move on Prospect Street? Because we lived in Main Street, then we worked, lived in a, the big duplex on North Prospect Street mm -hmm. before I moved to Stowe. I moved from there. We, we, were, we were in the north side of that house for six years. And we outgrew that house, and then we moved to Stowe. And uh, our house was being built, and we moved to Stowe. But, uh, but even then, Betty Foote lived next door to me on the other side of the duplex. Do you know Betty? She's 91. I do. And well, we were, we, they're our lifelong friends, you know. We were, but they, we saved each other's life. She had three kids and I had two when I moved in. And we just kept having babies there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and she, uh, she ordered her groceries. Who did she order from? Was Nifel still in business? Because I remember he'd come in and, and set the things on the table, and Fred Foot, do you know Fred Foot? Would climb up on the table, and he was only two years old. He'd look at that can, 40 cents, set it down, pick up another thing. Yeah, he wasn't two years old. I, well, I knew he's a liar. I knew he was going to be something. As he could read all those things. But so they did deliver groceries when I was first married. Where did you go to school? And tell me a little bit about going to school. Now you said I walked to school. You walked to Central. Yeah. This was the old Central we call the Union. No Central. School. And the bell would ring. And the bell. I would go down. Uh, I would cut through uh, the Getz's house up the street from our neighbors. 
Mrs. Getz didn't mind. And then I would cut through Mrs. Lodge's house on Pioneer. She didn't mind. She'd wave at me every morning. And I'd walk down the street. And uh, then down Manaway. And then up the hill to school. And um, I love school. I remember every one of my teachers. Really? Yes, I do. I think I do. From you started in, did they, have, they didn't have kindergarten then? No, I never. Yeah, I had, went to kindergarten, but I only went a half a year because I, I, I had appendicitis and I had to have surgery and I, I was very ill for, for the first semester, so I didn't get there. So I went to the Peister school for that, rode the school bus. And then I walked to school at the Central School every day, came home for lunch. Miss Hall was my first, first and second grade teacher. What, you said you loved school. What, what was the school day like that you enjoyed so much? I loved what, it all. what was it? What, what did you do during an, that you remember? Well, in, I would read. We had these little tables there in the first grade. We had first and second grade to get in the same room for the first two years. Oh. I had her for two years, and we had these little tables and the four little chairs, and we would sit up. And then she'd take us over and we'd start to read, Peter and Peggy. And I loved to read. And uh, we didn't have a lot of books in our houses. My dad and mother always read the newspapers and we took Collier's and all those kinds of things, but we didn't have a lot of books. Or what they were, they weren't new books. But the Spellmans, who I was, would go over to see, uh, they oversaw my reading a little bit. They started me on the Bobsy Twins, and I read all those. And they had a lot of books, Little Women, and they gave me those to read. They loaned those to me. And, uh, I love to read, and I just love school. That's all. What was the size of a class? Was it a small class? Do you remember? Or was it? I probably was about 20 kids, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And, and then after you finished at Central, where okay. well then in those days they, they they didn't call it middle school they called it junior high school and the seventh grade I went to Roosevelt was wow that was really different you know because there were these I had lockers next to senior boys you know and I am I'm short now I was short then and I'm skinny and little and probably looked like I should back in fourth grade or something and these great big guys was kind of exciting and scary at the same time, you know, but uh, yeah, we had junior high school there and then high school, you know, so uh, I just saw Bussy Parmenter die. He didn't know me for Madam, but I knew Bussy Parmenter because he was a very popular young man uh -huh. and we would go to dances after class at Roosevelt. Oh, they had dances on the oh, weekend? Yeah, I, I didn't. We just, all the girls would go. And they all allowed the junior high kids to go to after football games and things like mm -hmm. that. They'd have them, mm -hmm. like I'm sure they do now. And the they football was behind, the field was behind. Yeah, but behind the school, yeah. Did they have big rivalries still then with Rose? With well, Kent or... State, too, you know. Oh. Kent State. In fact, Dick Foot, we were friends for years, you know. <laughs> in fact, they talked about that at his funeral, but he never let. And Fred Foote gave a beautiful uh, eulogy for his father, and he was talking about he said, and, and he said, if I didn't say this, Dad would roll over in his grave. But he'll never forget the time that he was a quarterback when they beat Roosevelt High School. Now, Dick was older than I was, so I don't remember that game. But they did the year that he was quarterback. They beat Roseville High School, and that was a big rivalry. But when I was in school, we always. Cleaned the clocks. So <laughs> You're making me talk about old days. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's wonderful. I love the kids. Really do enjoy hearing that because it's it's not. Now, when you uh, came home, you talked a little bit about some of the things that you did. Um, uh, you did you listen to the radio? Did you have uh, you know Bert and Marge? And Mary Marlowe, I was, you know. Ma I, Perkins? Oh, yeah, Ma, yeah. I don't know whether, whether Mother listened to them, but I thought they were wonderful. Um, and then, of course, we listened to Jack Armstrong, and we listened to Little Orphan Annie, and we had the cold things and all that sort of stuff. 
be sent away for the Ralston box tops for Tom Mix's gun, <laughs> wooden gun. Charlie McCarthy, yeah. we listened to him. Of course, we listened to that on the radio. Did you go to the movies or did you go down to the Kent Opera House at any time? I went to the Kent Opera House, so yes. That wasn't as nice as the Kent Theater, and I lived in the Kent Theater. I, my mother was very lenient with me compared with my friends. My friends' parents seemed to be more strict with them than, than my parents were, and maybe mother did it just so she could get me out of the house in cleaning day. I don't know, but I was given a dime uh, to go to the Kent Theater every Saturday afternoon of my life for growing up, and I loved the movies. I absolutely loved it. I made movie scrapbooks, and I, I felt so badly. Do you I still have those? Them? No, I am sick. I, those got lost in my moving. Well, in the, where we we didn't have too many nice places when I was first married. At 458 up there, where where I stored those scrapbooks, they may be up there yet. I don't know. You know, they I put them back in there, and I don't know if I just didn't take them or what. But yeah, I, I was a movie fan. Real biggest thrill of my life was when I went to see Gone with the Wind, and I forget what, I couldn't afford the five dollars or something the first time around, but my mother came up with the two or three dollars. It was more expensive than any other movie? Gone with the Wind? Yeah, it was four, three or four hours long, as they're called. They had a big intermission, and so, it, yeah, it was five dollars when it first came out, and that was, that was like twenty-five dollars now, you know, and that was a lot of money. And mother said too expensive that I couldn't go. But the second time around, I went, and I didn't want to go with anybody. I'd read the book twice already, and uh, I don't know how old I was. I, I read that book when I was about eleven. I loved it. <laughs> That's great. Well, Kay, uh, Kay Han talks a lot about going to the movies and having her own special seat that she tried to mm -hmm. sit in. Did you have a special seat that no. you liked? You no, don't no, no. no, I remember, you know, I thought about the movies, about going there at night with my mother. We used to go to bank night. Daddy went to the Knights of the Pythians on North Water Street. That was up above Nifles, not Nifles, but in that area where the bank is now. The home bank, is that what they call it? And uh, it was in that area. And Daddy would go to Lodge, and uh, I think they played pool, too. They had a pool table in there. And um, we would go to bank night. Now, why bank was it night. called bank night? Well, it was a depression, you know, and they, if you would go to the movies, they'd have prizes of $50. They'd draw for a $50 prize or some such thing. I don't know. Maybe $25 and $50. It wasn't a whole lot of money, but it sounded like a lot of money to me. They always had a big crowd that night. And my mother dragged me to the movies and on school night. Can you imagine? I guess, so that's what I say. My mother was as strict as other mothers for some reason. I mean, she was a very devoted mother. Don't misunderstand. There were places I wasn't allowed to go and things like that. But I was allowed to go to the movies on Saturday, and I went by myself. Wow. Of course, every other kid in Kent was there, too. It would be packed on Saturday. All these kids all over town were there. That's, that's a wonderful story. Now, let us skip to your graduating from high school and what happened the day after you graduated from high school. I went to work at Twin Coach for Mr. Charles Chambers, and not the one in town now, because I know that gentleman. Uh, but... Um, his name was Charles. This man I worked for was named Charles Chambers, too, and he was a, a, a methods engineering was the name of the department I went to work in. And uh, I went to work with a stenographer's rating, but I was not a stenographer. I, I hated that job. I was a typist, and it's wonder I'm alive now, but to be 85, because that job involved typing work orders, which had some kind of an ink that got all over you. I mean, I would be covered in this purple ink, and they you would go in to wash up, and when you washed up, you used some chemical, screwed it on you, rubbed it all, and rubbed it in, rubbed it off, you know, wash your hands, then put soap on, and wash that off. And I thought afterwards, where I didn't get cancer, good you don't know what was in those things. 
but I did not like that job. But I worked at it two years, and then I worked for Bob Johnston. I bid on that job to be his secretary, and I had shorthand and everything from high school. So, so you had studied that. that in high school. I studied that in high school. Greg, there were two the Greg many. method. Or do, do, there yeah, were, I think it was, it was the yeah, Greg. Yeah, I even yeah. My my mother did the Greg shorthand. Yeah, that's what it was. And I wasn't too great about studying at first, the first semester that I took shorthand because I didn't really like to study that well. But by the second semester, I had absorbed enough when they started giving us dictation, I took off and I was next to the best student in shorthand. Wow. And, and then the typing, you yeah, had to typing, yeah. typing per typing. minute. Yeah, I was good at that too. I was good at that. So you went to work, and how did you, did you walk to work? I walked to work. On Lake Street? I never learned to drive until I was 27 years old, pregnant with four kids. Yeah, I walked to work from North Pearl Street, and uh, there, it was an experience. I, I mean, I still remember a lot of the people, the most, a lot of them gone. I worked for Ralph Jones, he was another one. I went from Mr. Chambers, I don't know what happened to him, I ended up with Ralph Jones, and he was a very nice man, and I liked him a lot, and he worked with Peggy George, who was a fixture at, at Twin Coach, and she lived to be a very old lady. I think she was way up in her 90s when she died, and uh, I couldn't I I'll type her, though, she was amazing, and she worked for, for Twin Coach for years and years, and that was 1946 when I went there. And they were making all the buses. They were making buses. And the buses were also in Kent, right? You could ride on the twin. We we had buses that were twin coach buses. I, I mean, we have some pictures, I assume. Oh, yeah, right. The little buses. Yeah. We didn't have buses that I recall, though, when I was a young girl in Kent. We didn't have buses at the university until about the 60s, I don't right. know. Right. They had the, the streetcar. Was the streetcar <sighs> still going when you were no. the interurban? I remember probably riding on that streetcar when I was maybe three, four years old. But mm -hmm. after that, the streetcar tracks were taken up. Mm -hmm. But I do remember riding on it because you used to ride through where, where Silver Lake is now. And, and I think it came out right about the street, right near where, in back of where my daughter lives now because she lives in Silver Lake. But it was in that area somewhere. And, and uh, I can remember riding that and going over that bridge at the gorge, too. That was oh. way up in the air, frightening. <laughs> when you were in the streetcar, I mean, you're looking out like this and there were no railings. You just looked out. <laughs> <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> Scary. Yeah. Probably. And the streetcar went out to Brady Lake, too. Did you go to the amusement park ever at oh, Brady yeah. Lake? Oh, of course. I learned to swim at Brady Lake from Comfort. Comfort Spellman uh, taught, uh, was in charge of the swimming program for Portage County. And the, the, the summer before that, Comfort's cousin had was teaching art lessons over in the corner of University Drive in Kent in a garage there, uh, Jesse Hines. So I took art lessons that summer. And for the picnic, we had a picnic at the end of the summer, we had a picnic out at Lot Owners Beach at, at uh, Twin Lakes. And I almost drowned that day. All the kids were jumping off the dock and the lady was catching us and she was tall and it was over our heads and she would catch us and put us back up. And of course I got excited, you know, got up, we were getting in line, and I jumped off and almost dropped. She walked away, and I'm going up and down, and screaming and yelling, and when my mother found out about my near miss, some girl finally looked at me, as I could see this girl, you know, looking at me, and she finally got down on one knee and reached out to me, and gave me her hand, and then I took a hold of her hand, well, went home and told my mother, who. So Comfort was teaching swimming lessons, and when they all found out about that, I got enrolled. So I took swimming lessons at Brady Lake, and That's I went great. all through everything out there at that old swimming lodge. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I went there many times to see fireworks on Memorial Day, and my brother Lloyd played in dance bands out in the dance hall out there. He was in a, a dance band when he was young, played the band show. And uh, so I've got pictures of him out at Brady. Lane. Oh, great. But somewhere. I don't know. Maybe my niece has those. I don't have them now, but she may have them. I've asked her that. You might be interested because there were some of the people in Kent. I believe, and I don't recall just who we played with, but I think he had some friends that, you know, were all from wow. here that played in those dance bands song. There were big bands, I guess, that came there, but I don't remember that. I was, wasn't old enough to go. But yeah, we went out there and I rode the, the whip and the merry-go-round and never got the roller coaster with. Now tell me about the Spellmans and about Comfort, because they were very important people in the history of our community, uh, pretty interesting people, and uh, what was your experience with the Spellman family? I was very close to you. I was like the little girl next door. And I don't know why they took an interest in me, so I never understood that, but their house was open to me, like, although those kind, they were open to other folks too. Always comfort was even down in St. Croix. I mean, she was a philanthropist and she took interest in people down there. Of course, they were all black. Comfort did not, Comfort and Burton did not know. They were color, not. Nothing they were. to her, to them. And they were, they did a lot of things in St. Croix. And Comfort's parents, she was raised with that because I remember they raised a foster child who used to come and visit them after she married and had a family. She had two sets of twins, I remember that. She used to bring the twins there at the house. So they raised a foster child. I don't know, I don't remember how long they had Dubby. That was her name. I can't remember her last name. No. <laughs> and they, they built the church in the, uh, they were, assisted, I think, in the South End um, yes, with yes. the African American uh, Community uh, Church. Uh, Bert Spellman had, uh, and his father, had their interest in real estate, according to some of the books. Well, I knew that because, and those people would come up and pay their rents, even if they didn't have checking accounts or anything. And I would be there and they would ring the doorbell and Bert would go get them, open the door, bring them into the through the vestibule into the house and into the front parlor where he had his office. And they, would do, they, they always came in the front door, they didn't, and they were black. And at uh, that time there was black, blacks in Kent only lived oh, in the no, South End? That's all, yeah, that's the only place they lived then, yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, there was, a, uh, there were people who were obviously not as accepting as the Spellmans were. Yeah, but they were, they were very accepting. And of course, Jesse was always, I called her Auntie, that I always called him Pop. And until Dana came along, which is the little child in that, the Movie. baby. That was their adopted daughter's grandchild. They adopted Marion. And uh, I was named after Marion. My mother, well, we lived right next door. And the girls, the girls were the same age as my older brother. Mm -hmm. Comfort was in Lloyd's class, my brother Lloyd, and uh, Marion was a year behind them. So they were, my mother knew them, and she thought, she thought so much of Marion, and so she was a pretty little girl. So she knew me after her. And I don't know whether that's where the interest was, but I was sort of dragged around by those girls and, and knew a lot of people through them. But um, they were fine people. They were, they were good people. They taught me a lot. <laughs> and you went off to the Lilac Gardens? No, I did not. You did? I don't think we ever went through the Lilac Gardens. I don't know why. Uh, because the Lilac Gardens were very, I mean, the cars were all over the neighborhood, you know, when they were there. Mm -hmm. But I lived next to the Lilac Gardens when I was first married in this little apartment at 458, which is still a little apartment. Believe me, it's a little apartment. <laughs> And I lived there until my Were the gardens shop. still large at that time, or had they? <clears throat> <clears throat> she was still showing them, but they weren't as popular then. Not as many people came. 
And, and I talked to Mrs. Wolcott. She was getting distressed with Henry because Henry didn't want to work in the gardens. And she was at the age, she was probably my age, you know. And she, she just didn't have the strength to do it all. And she'd try. And, I, mm -hmm. and Henry lived with her. Henry lived with his mother. I don't know that he ever was, I don't know what happened and to him after Daisy Wolka died. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, she worked in the gardens all the time. That was her life. She was as brown as a berry in that picture. There's a picture of that one hand I know is Daisy Wolka's hand because it looked like her. Because she was as brown as a berry. She was always out. She was always out in that yard. Hmm. Taking care of I her. I assume she had somebody helping her in the house because yeah. she was out in the garden. She didn't care about that. Jeff. I lived, at, lived next door one day and I had my little girl, we had a sandbox out next in the backyard and I probably shouldn't, living upstairs, I probably shouldn't have let her go down there, but I was at the window more looking out to see if she was there or And I let her go down and play one morning, too young to play. Of course, my parents lived over on Pearl Street and she was used to mother coming over and taking her home. And I looked out and she wasn't there. Well, I panicked. My husband worked at Padre Products at the time, and I, I didn't call him yet. I was about ready to. I was running all around the house, you know. And I ran down the corner of Maine and Pearl and didn't see any action. I knew if, if, if she'd gone across the street, my mother would have brought her immediately back, and nobody was coming. So back, back up, you know, yelling, 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 and finally I heard, far away and I went over in the gardens and Mrs. Wolkoff was so upset when she realized that she was there and she, I didn't know that she was there and she was back over a wall there was a beautiful wall at that time and you know if that wall is still there I I it was I, gorgeous I, yeah this big stone wall I didn't even know it was there at the time. I'd been in gardens, but not back there. And I think she told me at the time that that ran almost down to Snow Street. I don't know how far her property went, and she just had daffodils and everything mm. going. And they was her sort of wild back in there, you know, mm. but up up toward the house, they were very lovely. And she was still she was still maintaining or doing that. Mm. Now, when did you move from Kent? When did you meet your husband? Oh, when did I meet my husband? Yeah, when did you meet Mary? You got married in... I met him at Roosevelt High School. <laughs> he, did he have a locker next to yours? No, no. No. No, no. We just dated a few times, and then he went to the Navy. He was one of the, the, one of the classes that... Uh, went, the war was still on, and he went to the service. But he was young enough that he didn't get into the service. He never left until the spring of 45 for oh, the service. Good. So the war was over, really. He would have been a, uh, what was he trained to be? A, um, I think a gunner on a, on a plane for the Navy. But aviation machinist made that was a, that's what he was training to be. Well, then when the war ended, that what is Kabash and that he they found out he could type or something. And he ended up as a clerk for the rest of his, which was only about fifteen months. So he wasn't in very long. And then he came back. And then he came back, and he went to work at Twin Coach, and I was working there. And we started to date, and we dated for two years, and we got married. And then you moved, you stayed in Kent till when? 57. 57, and then you moved out of Kent. And we moved to Stone. Okay. Um, when, that's just a, a, we, a question we do ask a lot of people, is were, you must have come back to Kent at various times in the 60s and uh, visited, I assume. I was in Kent as much as... I have belonged to the Kent State U exercise program for 22 years. Oh. So you never take Kent out of the girl, I guess. Yeah. I never went very far from where I was born, although I never stayed in Kent. But my, I still come back to Kent. Three times a week I'm up there. They kept me healthy. Yeah. I, I highly recommend the program to you. 
Oh, good. Now, what we always ask, what was, what were your reactions and feelings about the time around the shootings in at, at Kent State? What did you, what what were your your view of it during those days in May uh, and uh, surrounding it did, from people that you knew here? And how did you? My daughter was up there. Uh, my daughter was a year before she graduated from Kent State. And she lived with my mother. My mother and father had built a home on South Pearl Street when they retired. And Shirley lived with my mother. My mother was a widow by that time. And she lived with Grandma and was at Kent State studying to be a teacher. When she became a art teacher, that's what she is or was. And she was up, she came home that weekend. I can't remember if those are the days I didn't approve very much, but I mean, she was frequenting the bar scenes and all that sort of stuff. Well, it was 3 2 beer. You could go into the bar. I don't know what she was probably drinking. Well, who knows? I hope that was all she, you know, I didn't want to know at that point, hardly. Because we didn't agree, and she threatened it. She wanted to be a go go dancer for a while, and she threatened to quit school, and this and that, you know. But she lived with mother, and uh, she came home that week. Weekend and on Saturday morning she worked for John Carson at at, at, at the, the uh, Donaghy's. Donaghy's. at Donaghy's then. So I brought her into work I think that morning and oh my goodness we got in town and the glass was all over North Water Street and it was a disaster you know and people were really upset and frightened and uh, we were appalled you know. I was so glad I moved to Stowe. Thank God I was raising my kids in Stowe. I didn't want my kids in Kent with all this. This was, you know, awful. We thought it was awful. And, Did but, John say anything? Did John Carson have anything? Because he was the I don't know. I don't remember. I dumped her off and went home, you know, and we were all upset about that. And anyway, she came home that weekend to stay. Mm. And I remember my husband setting her down on Sunday when she used to go back in, and he said, now look. The National Guard has been called out there, up there in that campus with guns. If there's a chance, if there's guns, there's a chance of something happening. If you, you stay away from any of those gatherings where the guns are. If you see guns, you go the other direction. Don't be up there in that. So she wasn't that day, but she was sitting up outside the student union, which was on that, I don't remember, is that Terrace Drive? Yeah. It was around there. Well, she was sitting outside the student union, which was right on, on the, that drive. Right on the. And she heard the guns. And she said, this guy was up in the roof, and he said, my God, they sh they're shooting people over here. And she said, about that time, the Jeep came roaring down Terrace Drive with a guy in it saying, get off this campus. Get off this campus and she said there was a bus sitting there right then to go to downtown Kent and I jumped on that bus and that took her downtown. She said when I got downtown what was more upsetting to me almost than hearing that they were shooting people because she didn't see any of that. She heard it. It was the fact she got off the bus and Dave Green of all people did you know which we did, or Shirley did. Dave Green was in a fight with a, a guy over an American flag he was trying to burn right in front of the city bank. Oh, I won't forget that. In the meantime, my mother-in-law is calling me because helicopters are all over Kent. And my, and my mother-in-law lived in Hampton Road in Kent. And so I started to call my mother because I knew Shirley was on campus. And the phone rang and rang oh. and rang, and I just let it ring. I just thought, if I hang this up, I'll never get through again. That occurred to me, and I wouldn't have. And I let it ring and ring and ring and ring and ring and ring for about five minutes, and Shirley picked up the phone. She got off the bus downtown mm -hmm. and came home to her grandma's. And she said, I'm okay, and then she told me all these horrible things that were going on. Now my feelings about it are different than my husband's. To this day, he is 
always maintains, and in a way I agree with him. He, he never felt that it, it was as much about Cambodia and Vietnam as it was that they were just people were coming from all over for the bar scene in Kent at that time. They would come from Pennsylvania. And Saturday night, you couldn't get through town if you drove through town. It was just wall to wall, young people for the bar scene. And he always felt it was a spring night and things got out of hand and they were his cane and, uh, but he, he was, his, his feelings are different than mine. And of course now, now his has mellowed a little bit, but he still feels those students were a lot to blame and he feels still sticks up for the, for Jim Rhodes or Governor Rhodes for Sitting in the National Guard, but of course she realizes now they learned a lot too. They didn't put bullets in their guns. You know. But now we go up to the university three times a week, as I said, and now that we're so elderly, the Dr. Glickman has got us the older ones. This is 60 and up, but we're far from 60. And she has us a place in the parking lot where that happened and where the memorials are. I walk by them every day. You know. Here's all the little pennies on them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I, you know, I, I feel, you know, yeah, much, I don't remember just how I felt at the time. We were horrified by it all, you know, and, and thankful that our daughter, mm -hmm. and, and, and the thing of it was, uh, Suzanne, my second daughter, she had two friends that were there, and they, they had a guy throw them on the ground and drag them underneath a car, and they saw those people being killed under there. And and one of the girls, I think both of the girls, took the next semester off. They were so shook up. Hmm. But so. Well, we have covered a lot of wonderful things. <laughs> a lot of I'm at your life. It's a wonderful, no. Oh, I've mean, had a wonderful life, and I'm very blessed yet. I mean, thus far, I have. You know, I just had my 85th birthday. I'm going to celebrate my 65th wedding anniversary on the 11th. But it isn't until the 28th. They're having it that because my, my grandson will be graduating from Ohio State Law School on the 10th. And my son will be coming up from South Carolina for that, and so they'll be here that weekend. And so that Jeff graduates on Friday, and and they're going to celebrate our 65th wedding anniversary on Saturday. So. Well, it sounds like you still have a great deal. How do you like all the changes? Oh, I think it's wonderful. It's a, this is wonderful, and that down there is wonderful. It's I'm, great to see the town. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I think it's it's great. Uh, I just, it kind of worries me in a way. I'm so worried about Acorn Alley and some of those places. Will there be enough? But, you know, the university is so big now and, and making it come down, I'm sure that it'll, it's not going to get any smaller, you know. that. No. So I think it's great. It's nice yeah. to see people downtown. There were oh, so many yeah. years when there weren't anyone coming right. there. It right. was so quiet.